saints. Let's all stand and worship our King today. Good morning. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who lived more than me. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging seas. My God. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. He wants to fight with you. Shout at your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in We want to fight with you. We shout at your praise. How you're gonna move, how you're gonna speak today. In Jesus' name we all pray. 
just to the head.
Peter chapter 3. We've been in 1 Peter for quite a while now, and the series title is up on the screen. We're calling the study in 1 Peter, Standing Firm in a Hostile World. Peter's writing to a group of believers that were suffering persecution, and Peter knew that this mild persecution was going to turn into a 
major, even life-threatening persecution in the near future. So he wrote this letter to encourage them to stand. And so the first section, Peter teaches them to stand in salvation. And he reminds them that we all came into this world as sinners that were saved by putting our faith in the finished work of Jesus, and that after being saved, we're going to be challenged. We need to learn to stand in that salvation. And then the second section, Peter taught us to stand in submission. And it's so important that we remember this. Peter is talking to his audience and he's saying, you've received the great commission and we have been commissioned by the Lord to make the gospel of Jesus Christ more appealing to the people around us. And Peter tells us how to do that. He says it it comes through submission. We need to be submissive people. So he says, you need to be the best citizen you can possibly be. You need to be the best employee you can possibly be. Your home should be an example of the gospel. And then he says that within the church, there needs to be an understanding and an attitude of submission to authority. And so Peter then last week brought us into this third and final section of his first epistle, and he exhorts us to stand in suffering. How many of you are so excited about suffering? Yeah, some crazy people out there. But none of us really love suffering. I mean, give you a choice of going to Disneyland or, you know, standing on a desert island baking in the sun. Most of you are going to do something fun, right? That's just the way our flesh nature is. But Peter says... And look up at the screen, because I want this to burn into your memory. He says, at some point, each of us as born-again believers are going to encounter unjust suffering. We encounter that because of our faith in Jesus. And then Peter says that the right response to unjust suffering always results in blessing. So that's what Peter's trying to teach us here in this this third section. So let's do this, as we have been. Let's stand and let's read our text together. reason we stand is we want to give honor and reverence to God's word, respect to God's word. But it's going to be up on the screen. Let's read loud and let's read together, beginning in 1 Peter 3.18. And he says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype, which now saves us, baptism, Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Oh, wow. (laughs) Father, in Jesus' name, we have before us a very challenging text, but a very fruitful text. And we acknowledge, Lord, that the only way we can properly learn your word is if your Holy Spirit comes and he first prepares our heart and then he also is in control of the teaching. So we yield ourselves to you, Lord, both teacher and audience. And we pray, God, that you would speak through this passage of Scripture in such a way that we are better equipped to know you and to share you with the world around us. Lord, in line with what Peter says, I pray that you would remind us how to suffer well, to suffer to your glory, and that even in our suffering, Lord, people would be drawn to Jesus. It's a hard prayer to pray, but it is right where we're at today, and we ask for your blessing. We ask that you come and teach us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Uh, Message title for today is Christ's Suffering and Rewards, and Almost every time I stand before you to teach, I tell you how excited I am about the passage, right? You hear that week after week, I'll go, I'm so excited about this passage today. And I'm very excited about this passage today. But I am also standing before you with a level of of like fear and trepidation because this is a hard passage. 
passage, and I'm painfully aware of the responsibility that I have as I stand before you and I teach. I'm going to answer for everything I say when I stand before the Lord, so I take this very seriously. The reason I'm saying this is because some of the best scholars and Bible commentators agree that part of the text that we're studying today falls into the category of what they call some of the hardest verses in the Bible to teach and to understand. And these are very hard uh, words. Let me just kind of survey. Put your eyes back on the text. Let me, let me survey what we just read. It begins with Peter talking about Jesus' death and his burial and his resurrection. And then Peter says something kind of weird. He says that then the, the Holy Spirit inspired Jesus to preach to spirits in prison. You might look at that and go, man, that's kind of weird. What's that all about? And then Peter talks about Noah and the flood and how that is a symbolic picture of how baptism saves us. But you and I both know because we have studied the subject of baptism in depth, even recently, baptism doesn't save us. Faith in the finished work of Jesus saves us, so we don't have a contradiction. What we have is Peter using baptism as a picture to illustrate something else. So, so that's kind of weird. Jesus preaching the spirits in heaven, and now we've got this new idea about baptism. And then Peter says that after Jesus preached to these spirits in heaven, that he ascended to heaven. I'm sorry, he preached to these spirits in prison, that he ascended to heaven. He sat at the right hand of the Father. And now every angel and every spiritual entity in the universe is subjected to him. And some of us have probably heard a lot of false teaching on these verses. I'm going to tell you, this is what I said to first service, is that I have heard so much false teaching that has come from these verses. If I had a dollar for every false teaching I've heard that came from these verses, I'd have my Harley. And it would have extra chrome on it, I'm telling you. The reason I say that is because a lot of men and women, people who handle the Word of God, sometimes don't handle it as carefully as they should. And when they come to a portion of Scripture like this, they don't do their scholarly homework. They don't dig. They don't study. They don't compare Scripture to Scripture. And then they read it and they say, well, this means this or this means this. And whether they mean to or not, they teach false doctrine and they lead God's people astray. And what I'm hoping to do today, and I am confident that we'll be able to do this, I think we're going to clear up any confusion that these verses may have created if you've heard false teaching, and we're going to get back to what they really mean. And you know how we're going to do that? Well, you're going to believe everything I say. No, we are going to compare Scripture to Scripture. And then the scripture is going to be the authority for what we teach today rather than my opinion or what I pulled out of a commentary or some really charismatic guy on YouTube. We're going to look at what the scriptures say. So let me give you an outline real quick. The question that I'm going to start with today is what do you say to people who are suffering? Well, what Peter does is he speaks to us and he says, yes, you are suffering. And I hate to tell you, but as a Christian, you're going to suffer even more. So Peter says, I'm going to talk to you about Jesus and how he suffered more than any man has ever suffered, but that his suffering led to both blessings and reward. And some of those blessings will be in your life and my life, and some of those blessings are rewards in his life. And that's what Peter's going to talk to us about. So I'll share four things with you today. We're going to look at the suffering and reward of the cross we're going to look at the suffering and reward of the resurrection. We're going to look at the suffering and reward of the grave. And then we'll kind of personalize this by looking at the suffering and the reward of faithfulness. So look at verse 18 where Peter talks about the suffering and reward of the cross. Put your eyes on the text, please. Peter starts with four words. He says, for Christ also suffered. Peter's reminding his audience, including you and I, that Jesus possesses first-hand understanding of unjust suffering. That in his life, he experienced more unjust suffering than anybody else ever has. And that his unjust sufferings resulted 
in amazing blessings for himself and for others. And Peter's about to tell us that. But what Peter's going to do here, and I really need you to stick with me, because I'm going to use a couple of words and you're going to go, time to go to sleep. Okay? Peter is about to give us a pretty in-depth lesson in biblical doctrine and theology. And I think it's important that as believers, we actually have a working knowledge of biblical doctrine and theology. And I'll tell you that an easy way to do that, look up at the screen, I'm recommending a book by Charles Ryrie called Basic Theology. It's written in layman's terms, but Ryrie does an amazing job of helping just the average layman learn solid biblical doctrine and theology. And and what happens is when a pastor gets up and says, hey, this morning we're going to talk about some biblical doctrine and theology, people pretend they're opening their Bibles on their phone, but now they're on Facebook or something like that. Or they decide it's time to go to sleep because I don't want to hear about doctrine and theology. I want to hear about something exciting. This is going to be exciting. And so, but I want to start with an illustration, something that Harry used yesterday morning when he was giving our Bible study at at Ironworks Men's Discipleship. Can, Can I do that? Harry told the story of a, I'm going to do it anyway, so Harry told the story of a, a pastor that got up and he's, he's preaching his Sunday morning message. About halfway through the message, this man just gets up and walks out the back of the church and he never returned. So at the end of the service, the pastor goes and speaks to the man's wife and says, Betty, you know I love you and I love your family. I, I, you know, I hope I have not done something to offend your husband and if I have, I really want the opportunity to make that right. And she goes, oh, pastor, don't you worry about it. My husband's been sleepwalking most of his life. (laughs) Okay, so I don't want anybody in here sleepwalking or sleep sitting or sleep anything because what we learned today is going to be so important. In fact, what we learned resulted in about three people receiving Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior during first service. And that was just in the room, not online or anything else. So don't go to sleep. In verse 18, Peter begins to develop a doctrine that theologians call the vicarious atonement of Christ. The vicarious atonement of Christ. And I'll give you the meaning of the two words. Vicarious means serving as a substitute for others. And atonement is a word that means to cover, and we're talking about to cover sin. And so... Peter is going to walk us step by step here in verse 18 through this doctrine. And you're going to walk away here this morning understanding this doctrine much better. So look at these words. For Christ also suffered once for sins. Peter's telling us and the audience that he's writing to that are suffering that Jesus, God the Son, second person of the Holy Spirit, Trinity left the perfection of heaven where he was the object of angelic worship. He added humanity to his deity and he came to earth in human form where he lived a perfect sinless life. But rather than being received by the inhabitants of the world, he was rejected, he was ridiculed, he was falsely accused of evil, he was betrayed by a close friend, he was arrested. He was abandoned by all of his followers. He was beaten, he was mocked, and he was tortured. Now, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah wrote that Jesus was beaten so badly that he was no longer recognizable as a man. So he was beaten so badly that maybe he just looked like a piece of raw meat instead of a man's face. And then, according to so many scriptures, Jesus was then crucified on a Roman cross. And Peter is trying to say to us, Jesus died to pay for your sin and for my sin. And I want to draw your attention to another word that Peter uses here. It's the word once. For Christ also suffered once for sins. Jesus teaches, I'm sorry, Peter teaches that Jesus' vicarious atonement for our sin was sufficient to appease the Father's wrath against us because of our sin. He suffered one time, and the Father now says, my wrath has been 
removed. My anger has been quenched. What Jesus did is sufficient. And I have to tell you that this is so liberating for people like me that grew up in the Roman Catholic tradition because we were taught that Christ's sacrifice had to be repeated again and again and again. And later, as I studied this for myself, I came to realize that the Mass, which is the church service that Catholics participate in, whether it's weekly or daily, it's a, it's a re-crucifying of Christ over and over and over. And so as a former Roman Catholic, I've been liberated by this idea that God's wrath against me because of my sin has been completely removed by one act of righteousness on Christ's part. And I want you to notice that, that Peter is telling us that once the Father was satisfied, that now we can be brought back into a relationship with our Heavenly Father. And it's interesting because Peter also touches here on, on the doctrine of propitiation. Now, I'm not going to get into it, but if you get Ryrie's book, you can study it for yourself. And it appears in other places in the New Testament. The, the idea is that God is satisfied with the sacrifice of Christ. So we can add nothing to it. We don't have to be religious. We don't have to somehow do good works to earn God's favor or anything like that. God looks at what Jesus did and he says, I am now satisfied. But it's interesting because I look at that and I think, how can the Father's, be, Father's wrath be satisfied when I continue to sin? How many of you have sinned since you got saved? How many of you just lied because you didn't raise your hand? Thank you. We've all sinned. We're, we're, Jesus died for sins past, present, and future. And look at what Peter says here. He calls him the just for the unjust. He's just, we're unjust. And I'll explain this. Adam and Eve were representatives of the entire human race and together they brought sin into the world. And from them on, every human being who has ever been born was born under the curse of original sin. Everybody comes into the world a sinner and needs a savior. Because of God's righteous requirements, he says, okay, one man sinned and brought sin into the world. In order for that sin to be properly paid for, a human being has to pay for the sin. So that's why Jesus added humanity to his divinity. Because a man had to die to pay for the sin of all men. And so Jesus was perfect. Peter says he was just. You and I are imperfect. We're unjust. And God sent Jesus as the perfect sacrifice to die in place of all of us imperfect people. And what's the result of all this? Keep reading. It says here that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. And Peter says Jesus willingly suffered death and burial, and you and I received the gift of eternal life if we put our faith in his finished work. Jesus also, and we'll look at this in a minute, but he was personally rewarded with resurrection. You and I are given the blessing of the possibility of being forgiven for our sins if we'll respond to Jesus in the right way. So I want to talk about the application here because we've now had a theology lesson and we're now theologians, right? And theologians need to learn to apply what they learn. So the application here is Peter said that Jesus' unjust suffering resulted in blessing for the human race. And I'll just summarize it. Peter says this, you can have the absolute confidence that when you leave this life and you cross over into eternity, we call that process death, when you die, you can have the absolute certainty that your sin is forgiven and that you're going to spend eternity with God rather than separated from God. Where does it come from? Being a good person, right? No, that's not what Peter said. Oh, it comes from being part of my denomination, a Catholic, a Baptist, a Presbyterian or something. No, that's not what Peter said. It comes from helping little old ladies across the street. No, it comes from showing up at Calvary Chapel even when it's raining outside. No, it comes from putting our faith in 
in the finished work of Jesus Christ. He was the just one who died on behalf of the unjust ones. And so I want to bring this to a question right now. We understand it. We understand the application. My question to you right now, saints, and those watching online at home is, do you actually have this confidence? Do you have the absolute confidence that if you got in your car at 1230 or whatever time you drive out of here today and you pulled out of the parking lot and you got in an accident and you died, that you would stand before the Lord and he would say, welcome into my kingdom. Now, I have that confidence and it's not because I'm part of a denomination or a good person or anything else. It's because I have put my faith in the finished work of Jesus. His vicarious atonement for my sin has made me acceptable to the Father. Nothing less than that. So I ask you, saint, do you have that absolute confidence? If you do, I'm going to just ask you to do one thing. Live your life in constant awe of the gift given to you and worship Jesus daily for what he did for you. Amen? Amen. It was neat. First service, I was back there on the side of the sound booth over where Kelly's sitting. And we got into one of the choruses of one of the songs and I heard voices being raised from this side that were so loud that they drowned out the worship team for a couple of seconds. And I'm thinking to myself, they know they're saved. They're thanking Jesus for what he did. But listen, the other group, if you're here, you're watching online, if you don't have that confidence... As I'm describing the possibility of your death today, and you're saying, I, I don't know where I'm going, Pastor Randy. I'm, I'm not real sure about this. My second question is this. Do you want that confidence? And I can't imagine anybody would say no. So I'm going to just move forward as if somebody in the room shouted out, yes, I want that confidence. And I'm going to tell you how you get it. And I'm going to share with you what's often called the Romans Road. This is how oftentimes we share our faith with somebody. But if you don't know Christ today, I want to take you down the Romans road. Look up at the screen. The Apostle Paul writes this in Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Paul just says this. We were all born sinners and, and we've offended God. We're in a broken relationship with God because we came into the world under the curse of original sin. So if you can acknowledge that, and if in your heart you have this desire to turn away from sin, Paul says, great first step. Romans 6.23, he says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul says, if you die in your sin, the paycheck that you will get for living your life without having your sin forgiven, the paycheck for that is, first of all, the physical death that you'll experience, but then the spiritual death that you will spend your life eternity, excuse me, you will spend your eternity separated from God in a place that the Bible calls hell or Hades. We'll look at it in a minute. But if you are forgiven, you spend your eternity with God, with Jesus in heaven. Okay, so he goes on in Romans 5, 8 and he says, but God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. One translation says Christ died for the ungodly. Paul says, yes, you were born a sinner. Yes, and if you die a sinner, you are in the gravest trouble. But Romans 5, 8, this is what Paul says. He says, God will receive you as a sinner. He says, if you are a sinner and you come to him with a broken heart over your sin, with, with contrition, his love is bigger than your sin, and he will accept you. And there's a little bit more to it. That's Romans 10, 9, and 10. It says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That word saved means saved and delivered from the wrath of God that every sinner deserves. And then verse 10, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Paul says, if you believe everything I've been telling you, simply do this. In your heart, believe that there's only one way to be saved and that's faith in the finished work of Jesus. And then speak it out loud. Confess with your mouth. Yes, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is my Lord. And Paul says, you will be saved. 
And there's a skeptic in the room. Someone's going to say, I don't know, that just sounds too simple. Paul speaks to that. Romans 10, 13. Notice what he says here. He says, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Listen, the only thing you need to be saved is to be a sinner. A sinner who's willing to confess their sin and confess their need for a savior. To confess that there's only one savior, it's Jesus of the Bible. And then to ask him to give you his righteousness in place of your sin. And that's what the scripture says is required to be saved. So I'm going to share a quick story. I'm going to ask you to do something and then we're going to move on to the hard part of the Bible study because this was the easy part. I believe I was 12 or 13 years old. And um, again, raised in the Roman Catholic tradition and I, I always had this deep awe and reverence for God, but something was missing and I just, at one point, I even wanted to be a priest, okay? I felt this call from the Lord. My neighbor, elderly lady, invites me to youth group at First Baptist Church Albuquerque, and I experienced something I had never seen before. A man opened a Bible and just led a Bible study. Brother Ricks Tillman, thank God for that man. Brother Ricks Tillman was the youth pastor. And he did a Bible study from John chapter 3, and he came to John 3.16 that says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. But he also taught verse 17. For the Son of Man did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And folks, I literally stood up in my seat and said, I want to be saved. I finally got it. I, I got it. And, and Brother Rick stopped at that moment. And I mean, he didn't even know who I was. And he goes, anybody else want to be saved? And about six or seven, I don't remember how many, there's just a bunch of us. I was in my own little world at the moment. But a bunch of us stood up and we just, we want to be saved. And that man introduced me to my Savior, Jesus Christ, along with a bunch of other kids. We had this cool youth revival going on. We're out reaching the streets you know, with the gospel. So since nobody stood up in the middle of this, I just want to say, if you want to be saved, if you're at home, whether you're in the room, this was such a sweet moment, first service. If, if, if you realize today, I'm a religious person, I think I'm a good person, but I think the scriptures just told me that I'm an unsaved person because I'm not trusting Jesus. Would you pop your hand up? I just want to acknowledge you or what God did here this morning. If you're at home, send me an email, randy at calvaryguru.org. I need to know you met the Lord today. Okay, could someone please fake it? I don't know. Thank you, thank you. I see you there in the first row. Yes, there in the back. I always, when, when people don't respond, you'll always see me go like this. I see you in the back row. I see you in the back row. Because no one knows if I'm telling the truth or not. I don't want to preach the gospel and have nobody respond. <laughs> but can I tell you a sobering thought right now? My Christian neighbor, took me to church and that's where I heard the gospel if you bring your friends to church I promise you church they'll, they'll hear the gospel they'll have an opportunity to be saved but let me tell you church is not the primary place where people are supposed to get saved church is where saints get equipped for the work of the ministry then you go out and you tell people the gospel you catch them bring them here I'll clean them get it you catch the fish bring them here with the word of God I promise you week after week we'll clean them Okay, but it does break my heart when so often the sanctuary is full of only Christians because I'm evangelistic from the pulpit. I want to tell your friends and family about Jesus. And when they come here, they're going to have an opportunity. Bring them, pray for them, and bring them. So, hey, here's the thing. Jesus said, Peter said, excuse me, in verse 18, that Jesus' unjust suffering resulted in the greatest blessing that you and I can have, which is salvation. But we're going to see here that, that Jesus' suffering also brought him a reward. So let's look at verse 22 and look at the reward of resurrection. And you're probably thinking, okay, Pastor Randy, you taught us verse 18, and now you're skipping 19, 20, 21, and you're going to 22. Why are you doing that? If you come here regularly, you're going to, you're going to get this in a second. You know how sometimes I'm teaching and then I go off on a rabbit trail? And then I go off on another rabbit trail to kind of illustrate what I was teaching. And, and then I go off on a third rabbit trail and eventually I come back to the main point. That's what 
Peter's doing in 1920 and 21. He's going to run a couple of really weird rabbit trails. And in verse 22, he comes back to the main thought. So let's, let's, let's summarize the main thought and then we'll look at those rabbit trails. So Peter says, hey, the, uh, the suffering of Christ brought us salvation. But he, he finishes that thought in verse 22 where he says, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. After Jesus' death and burial came his reward for his suffering, his personal reward, which was his resurrection. He suffered and then he was raised from the dead. And God the Father, knowing that people would doubt the resurrection caused Jesus to live in and around Jerusalem in his resurrected body for 40 full days. For 40 days, Jesus walks around in his resurrected body, and countless people believed in him because of the resurrection. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15 that at one time, more than 500 people witnessed the resurrected Christ at just one event. But there were two very key people who witnessed the resurrection of Jesus who before his death rejected him, after his resurrection, they embraced him as Savior, and they were his own brothers, his brother James and his brother Jude. And the two of them were blessed later to become authors of Scripture, writing the book of James and the book of Jude. So we see that the resurrection has incredible power to convince us of the gospel Well, after those 40 days came another reward for suffering. He ascended, notice here, to the Father, and he took his place at the Father's right hand. It says that at that time, angels and authorities and powers were all made subject to him. So so Jesus leaves the earth. We read about it in the Gospels, especially Luke's Gospel, and he's taken up. The apostles and disciples are watching him. He's taken into the clouds, and then he disappears. And we learn here where he went. He, He went to the seat of supreme honor where he now rules and reigns over all creation. He's the king of the universe. In fact, look up at the screen. I just, I couldn't help myself. I, I wrote this, and I, I want to read it to you word for word. Peter reminds us that he who suffered the most received the most glorious rewards for his sufferings. And you know, some of you in this room, you're suffering more than others. I just want to speak to you who are suffering terrible things right now, and you're staying the course, and you're sticking with the Lord. Jesus suffered more than any other man ever suffered, but he was glorified more than any other man was glorified. He sits at the right hand of the Father. He is the king of the universe. Every angel, every demon, Satan himself are subjected to him. But you, you're going through some deep things. You need to understand that your suffering is going to result in incredible glory and blessings both here on earth and especially in heaven. And just let me say one more thing and we'll move on. I want to remind you of a couple of things. How often do we go through seasons of deep suffering and and we talk about Satan more than we do Jesus? You know, you walk out after church and you're just thinking, what an amazing, amazing morning at Calvary Chapel. I got a flat tire. Satan's trying to steal my joy after a good church service, right? And we always want to say it's the enemy. It's a demonic attack. It's this and that. We see here and we learn from the book of Job that anytime Satan is going to work in our lives, he has to get the Lord's permission. And if the Lord allows Satan or a demon or anybody else to mess with you, it is to grow you. It is to mature you. It is to take like a a high-speed angle grinder and run it across the metal of your life to make a sharper edge. And so often we give Satan way too much credit. Amen, church? So Peter's going to use Jesus' suffering to remind you and I that our unjust suffering for Christ's sake will always lead to at least three rewards. This is what we learned in in this verse here. Our suffering is going to draw people to Jesus. His suffering drew us to him. When you and I suffer well and people walk up and they go, okay, dude, I don't know what's wrong with you, but it seems like you've been going through a really rough time and you still smile and you're always singing and 
you got that flat tire and, and you just you can never be down. What's wrong with you? All of a sudden you have an opportunity to share the gospel because your suffering drew people. And the second thing is our, our suffering is going to be a catalyst for us to experience the blessing of personal growth and maturity. Look at what we'll start with next week. First Peter 4, 1 and 2 on the screen here. Peter says, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Peter's trying to tell us that suffering purifies us. When you're going through the depths of suffering and you're staying close to the Lord, he's purging you. Sometimes it's just weird fear. You ever go through a tough time and the first thing you think, it's because of what I did yesterday. How many of you experience that like I do? That's a good thing. Because sometimes we begin to suffer and, and the Lord is purging something from our lives. So I'll give you this encouragement, church. Next time you start going into a, a, a season of deep suffering, Put your eyes on Jesus and say, God, what in my life do you want to remove right now? What, what fleshly thing have I held on to that you want to get rid of? And start to get rid of that thing, and you just might see that season of suffering take a left turn and go somewhere else. Sometimes it's designed to purge us, to teach us. I don't want sin anymore. Sin got me in this trouble. And then the third and this is just something that, that we'll study at another time. We've seen it over and over. But by looking at the suffering of Jesus, we're reminded that even if you and I die for our faith, let's say things get really bad in America and Christians go into this deep, deep persecution and you have to stand and look somebody in the eye that says you either deny Christ or we kill you. And you say, I guess you've threatened me with heaven. Go ahead. We have this confidence that even if we die for our faith, we are going to be in the presence of glory. Amen? Three things we learn from that. Now, I've been... Oh, good. I've only got a few minutes. We've got here verses 19 through 21. And again, like I said at the beginning, these are some of the hardest verses in all of the Bible to accurately teach. And I'm going to keep it simple, but I'm going to try to be thorough. I want to look at verses 19 and 20, and I want to talk about the reward of the grave. I'm going to start in about the middle of verse 18. Look down at your Bible. Read with me. Peter says, Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine longsuffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. Boy, I bet you wish you were me right now, having to explain this, right? Have you ever wondered what Jesus did from the time that he died and his body was laid in the tomb until that third day, Sunday morning, when he was raised from the dead? I've heard some people say, yeah, he slept. Have you seen what he went through that previous week? He slept. He was resting, right? But theologically and, and biblically, what went on is given to us right here in this text. And so... Look at verse 18. It says that he was put to death in the flesh. We understand this. I already explained this. This is Peter reminding us that Jesus experienced physical death to pay for our sin, and then his body was laid in the tomb. But then look what Peter says. He says, but made alive by the Spirit. And if you're just simply reading through this and, and you're, you're just kind of glossing over Scripture, you immediately think that that's talking about the resurrection. But I challenge you that I don't think that's speaking about the resurrection. The, the context here is Jesus in the grave. And what Peter appears to be saying is that as Jesus' lifeless body lay there in the tomb, the Holy Spirit quickened Jesus' spirit to go back to work. His body was in the tomb, but the real part of Jesus, his spirit... He went right back to work doing what? Peter says, well, he went and he preached to the spirits in prison. Now we're kind of looking at a hard thing again and going, well, who were these spirits? And where is this prison? And I'm going to answer those questions now by taking you through Scripture I'm going to move quickly. If anybody wants my notes, send an email to randy at calvarygreer.org. I'll get you a PDF as quickly as I can. But I want to just take you on a journey. 
to try to help you understand what happened while Jesus' body lay in the grave. So look at the screen, if you would. Luke chapter 23, we're reading the story of Jesus being crucified between two criminals. One mocked him, and then the other one realized that maybe spiritual things needed to be dealt with in his life. So he confessed his sin, he repented, and he's seeking forgiveness. And look at Jesus' words in Luke 23, 42. Jesus said to him, or no, he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He, he's repenting of his sin. He's asking for forgiveness. Jesus said, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, Jesus didn't ascend to the Father until 40 days after his resurrection. So he can't be talking about heaven. This, this word paradise is not talking about heaven where God lives. The reason we know that is because under the old covenant, under the law of Moses and the old covenant, when human beings died, they didn't go to heaven or hell. They all went to the same place. It was a place called Hades, the abode of the dead. Those who died in faith looking forward to Messiah went to one side of Hades that was called Abraham's bosom. It was a place of reward and comfort. Those who died apart from faith in the future Messiah, they went to the other side called Hades. It was a place of torment and there was no hope. In fact, Jesus in Luke chapter 16 tells the story of the rich man and Lazarus and he illustrates this for us. I don't believe this is a, a parable in the same way the others were parables because Jesus uses names here. I believe this is a true story. Look at Luke 16, 19 through 23. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and he fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. So just by reading that, we know that, that he was a man of faith. He had faith in the coming Messiah. But the rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So we see this rich man, he's got all the characteristics of a person who doesn't know the Lord. He didn't care for Lazarus. He didn't help the poor or anything like that. And, and because he didn't have faith in the future Messiah, he's carried to the other side of Hades, which is the place of torment. And, and if you went through, and you can read the rest of this on your own later, we don't have time... But one of the things that we see here is that the righteous went to Abraham's bosom. The unrighteous went to Hades, this place of absolute torment. From this story we just read, we read that the inhabitants of each compartment are still alive. They still have thought and feeling and emotion. and They feel pain or they feel pleasure. They have memories of earth and they can actually see each other across a great chasm. And then later in the story, Jesus tells the rich man that once a person enters eternity, their eternal fate is sealed. If they end up in Abraham's bosom, that's great, especially for eternity. But if they end up in the other side, Hades proper, there's no second chance. There's no turning back. There's no, I wish it would have been different while I was alive here on earth. At that moment, both of these characters had sealed their eternal fate by what they believed while they were alive here on earth. And so when Peter says that Jesus preached to the spirits in prison, we've established what the prison is. The, the prison is Hades. But who are the spirits there in the prison? Back to 1 Peter, notice verse 20. It says here, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. Now, this is where commentators just have all sorts of different things to say, and some of the worst false doctrines come out of this. Some people teach, and I've sat live under a man who taught this, that when Jesus died during those three days, he had to go to hell and be tortured by demons to pay for your sin and for my sin. 
But we already learned that his sin on the cross is what paid for our sin. His death on the cross is what paid for our sin. I'm so far ahead of myself. I need to take a deep breath here. Okay, total false doctrine, right? But what we do see here is that the spirits that Jesus preached to were present when Noah was preaching to his audience. And I'm not going to tell you I understand all of this. I'm not going to tell you I can explain all of this. But Peter tells us that these were probably some of the humans that listened to Noah while he preached for 120 years while he's building the ark. And they rejected the gospel. And then, depends on what you believe about Genesis 6, here in America we like a very sanitized, comfortable Bible. We want to be able to believe and explain everything and we want it all to be comfortable. But Genesis 6 says that there was a time where the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they went into them. And out of this ungodly union came these giants called the Nephilim. Hey, I can't explain it. I didn't write it. But I'm going to tell you as I read it, this is what I think happened is that there was this ungodly union between fallen angels and human women and this race of giants were on the earth and they were corrupting human DNA and all this other crazy stuff and God looked down and said it's not bad enough that man has the desires of his heart only you know wickedness all the time but now we got this weird race of people I'm gonna send a flood and wipe out the world I'll just fix it with a flood okay now again I don't have time to get into all of this I gave you just enough but Peter tells us that Jesus descended down into Hades and he preached and the context there is that those who had rebelled against God who had rejected the idea of a coming Messiah heard their final condemnation that Jesus said you guys heard about this coming Messiah well it's me I just died on a cross to pay for the sin of everybody but you guys rejected this message you lived ungodly lives and your fate is forever sealed and, and unfortunately when Revelation chapter 20 comes along at the end of time and Hades and death are emptied out you guys are gonna stand at the great white throne judgment and then you're gonna be cast into the lake of fire and I bet his heart was just broken but it's interesting because Paul talks about this and it appears that Jesus, as he preached, he preached a message that condemned one group, but he preached what brought liberation to those who had died by faith. Look at the screen, Ephesians 4, 8 through 10. Paul's writing, he says, Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean? But that he first also descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. So comparing scripture to scripture, it appears that Paul is saying also that Christ descended and he went to Abraham's bosom and he said, you guys died in faith. I've got a surprise for you. This is not your eternal destination. I'm going to now take you to the Father. And as he ascended to his Father, he led captivity captive and he brought all of these people into their eternal reward. Isn't that amazing? Now, it's hard to explain all this in one quick Sunday morning when I'm already long-winded. So I'll let you guys dig into it on its own. I believe that this is the safest and most biblical interpretation of what Peter is talking about. It just completely fits the whole biblical narrative. And so let's wrap this up by looking at now the reward of faithfulness because we've been talking all about Jesus all about Jesus, everything he's done. Now Peter wants us to maybe look at our own lives. And he says something that's highly controversial here. In the middle of verse 20 into 21, he says, eight souls were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God. Again, a verse that has caused so much controversy in the church, there, there's a group within the larger body of Christ that teach a doctrine called baptismal regeneration. And what that means is simply that you're not actually saved until you're baptized. But what we've clearly seen by taking apart the scriptures, and if you want to see this for yourself, search our YouTube channel for one of two messages. One is called a biblical look at baptism, and the other is called a demonstration, an outward demonstration of an inward transformation, two teachings I've done on baptism in the last three years, we've clearly seen that baptism does not save us. 
faith in the finished work of Jesus saves us. Every person in the scriptures that were baptized were already born again by faith in the finished work of Jesus. Baptism was the step they took where they looked at the world around them and they said, I'm no longer part of you. I am with Christ. And in the context of what Peter is writing, Peter uses the waters of the flood as what he called an antitype or a symbol of baptism. And this is where it gets really hard because people will say, hey, Peter came right out and said that it's baptism that saves us. But church, listen to me. He was not talking to the unsaved. This was not an evangelistic message. He was talking to born-again believers who were facing the depths of suffering. And he says, in the same way that Noah was faithful in the midst of the worst suffering, he says, that's the kind of faithfulness that God has called us to. And I'll, I'll bring baptism into it in a minute. But I want to show you something because people will take this text and they'll say, see, it says right there, baptism now saves us. There's an antitype which now saves us, baptism. I want to ask you a question. Baptism is when a person comes into contact and they are completely submerged in water, right? And then raised. We've, we've shown from scripture, it's a picture of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Peter says, I'm talking about something so different here. Peter says, let's talk about the waters of baptism. When the waters of baptism came, they came to wipe out a rebellious human race and whoever these Nephilim were, right? Can you agree with me on that? Were these waters of, of salvation or were these waters of judgment? These were waters of judgment. And so Peter's not saying, hey, you need to be immersed in the waters of judgment in order to be saved. Peter's saying, saint, listen to me. He says, your baptism was not just this thing where everybody else in the youth group was going, hey, I'm getting baptized, are you? Yeah, what's baptized? Yeah, I guess I'll do that. Peter's saying, baptism is this step in the Christian life where we say, I am so done with the old life of sin. I am being baptized into Christ and into his death and into his suffering. And Peter goes, let's look at Noah. Suffering all around him. He's suffering the mocking of people. He's suffering the scorn of people. It's going to rain, Noah? What's rain? Okay. God's going to judge the earth. With what? You call it rain? Noah, come on, all right? He was mocked and he was maligned just like Christ was, and yet he stayed until the very end. When the waters of judgment came, Noah got into the means of salvation that were given to him. It was called an ark. When the waters of judgment are coming towards an unsaved person, they get in the means of salvation that God has provided. It's called Christ. But to a believer, Noah is saying we don't take baptism lightly. Baptism is that picture of sticking with the Lord in the midst of suffering to the very end so that, if you notice here, we have the answer of a good conscience towards God. He is not talking about salvation from sin. He is talking about standing in the midst of suffering. He's using baptism as a picture He's not creating doctrine about salvation. Study it for yourself. You are going to see that as you take the text apart in its context. So I know I didn't give a whole lot of time to that, but I think by teaching the truth of baptism, I've already done what I need to do in the past. So let me give you four quick takeaways that you can apply to your life from this text, and then we will sing our closing song, and we'll walk out the door and start suffering for Christ. Amen? But listen, four takeaways, because I think this is so important from this text. In verse 18, we learned about the vicarious atonement of Jesus Christ and how that is what made it possible for you and I to be saved and to live with the confidence of heaven. And once again, if you didn't respond before, but you know you need to be saved, put your faith in the finished work of Jesus. Pray a simple prayer like, God, I know I'm a sinner. I realize I need a savior. But that Savior is the one and only Jesus Christ of the Bible. So, Lord, I, I'm turning from my sin, and I receive the free gift of forgiveness that you offer me in Christ.
and I know my sin is forgiven, and now I ask you, fill me with your spirit so that I'll have power to live and to, to persevere with you, God, and thank you for saving me. Something simple like that, and the Lord promises you will be saved. In verse 22, we learn that suffering teaches us to be done with sin. If you're in a season of suffering right now, just maybe take some time, get alone with the Lord, and just say, God, what is it that you're trying to purge from my life? This suffering has come, I believe, Lord, that I could persevere, but maybe you're cleansing me. Show me, Lord, that I can participate with that. Verses 19 and 20, I just want us to remember that we should rejoice that we were once a captive to sin, but we are now set free in Christ. We were like those prisoners, but we heard the gospel and we responded and he saved us. Thank God for that. And then verse 22, I just want to challenge your baptism. Not, not was it effective or anything like that, but, but was it, was your baptism really saying to the world around you, I'm done with you. I am so done with you. I am now 100% sold out to Christ. And the world may say, well, we're going to persecute for that, persecute you for that. And where we look at the world and we say, well, then bring it on. Because the reason I was baptized is because I wanted to tell this whole world that literally, please forgive me, come hell or high water, I belong to Christ now, and I will not back down. That's what Paul, Peter's trying to teach us about baptism. If your baptism was just some religious event, if it was the next thing on the list that you figured was part of your spiritual journey, and it wasn't this proclamation that I'm done with the world, I'm done with sin, I suggest you participate in our next baptism and do it that way. So Father, today... Such a beautiful portion of scripture, just completely focused on the finished work of Jesus and the blessings and the rewards that have been given to us because of what he did. His death gave us life. His resurrection gave us hope. Lord, in his death, he, he went and he preached to the spirits in prison to liberate them. But Lord, it reminds me of something. The, the people in Hades that heard whatever it is that Jesus preached, whatever he said, Lord, it sealed their faith. There was no second chance. And there's some false teachers out there, Lord, bringing these doctrines that after we die, we'll get a second chance and God's gonna let us into heaven if we change our mind about hell and all this. Lord, that is heresy. And I pray, Lord, that you would protect the hearts and the minds of people. The author of Hebrews said it is appointed unto man to die once and then the judgment. Lord, help us to stand on your word and not the creative ideas of some of these charismatic speakers that are taking people captive with false doctrine. If there's anybody today, Lord, and they're just thinking, you know, I'll just wait because there's another chance coming. There's another chance coming. I wonder how many people, Lord, that heard Jesus' voice who were on the wrong side of Hades wish they would have not waited another day to embrace the salvation that was offered to them. And then, Lord, just the last thing as Paul talked about baptism. Lord, we were challenged in that portion of Scripture to be like Noah. Father, to just stand strong in the midst of the worst suffering because what's coming next does not even begin to compare to the suffering, Lord. The suffering is nothing compared to what heaven is going to be like. So Lord, today we, we just arm up with faith and with courage. And we say, God, we're going to stand with you like Noah did. We're going to suffer for you like Jesus did. And we expect Jesus to meet us in the midst of that suffering and carry us through. And we pray, Lord, that our lives would glorify you, that we could have a clear conscience in all of this, God. So we praise you, we thank you, Lord, and we ask that you would do an amazing work in our lives today. Give us an opportunity to share the love of Jesus with somebody before this day is over. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.